Chapter 9. Telegraph. What hath God wrought? Samuel F. B. Morse, 1844. The electric telegraph grew up with the railroad, and it made long-distance railroading possible. But the first telegraph, writing from afar, was built in 1791 by Claude and René Chappe in France. It used sound along with times on a clock face rather than electrical impulses to send messages, and the revolutionary government soon adopted it. This telegraph simply enabled communicating messages to afar without physically moving a person or document. Abraham Nicholas Edelkrantz developed an optical telegraph in Sweden soon after hearing of the shop invention in 1794. By 1795, the British had also devised a telegraph system using shutters that passed or didn't pass light to transmit messages visually. Different combinations of open and closed shutters indicated different letters or words. By the 1830s, such systems were common throughout Europe. Typically, relay stations or nodes were located on hills for maximum visibility, hence the term Telegraph Hill. An optical telegraph line operated between Philadelphia and New York in 1840 for the benefit of its owners. We don't have networks of optical telegraphs dotting the landscape today, as the technology was made obsolete by the electric telegraph. Some difficulties in the technology had to be overcome, including transmission of electrical signals over long distances and efficient coding. Samuel F. B. Morse, a famous American artist, apparently unaware of the difficulties others had had, few advertised their failures widely, proceeded to develop some of the core technologies that made up the telegraph system. He is most famous for the signaling code of dots and dashes named for him. He also developed a mechanism for recording the signals on paper, creating a transcript of the messages. Joseph Henry, an American scientist and the first head of the Smithsonian Institution, developed the means for transmitting electrical signals over long distances by using small batteries in series rather than a single large battery. In parallel with American efforts, Cook and Wheatstone were developing a different electric telegraph in England. The first telegraph line was 2.1 kilometers between Euston and Camden Town stations on the London and Birmingham Railway. The first line had five wires because of the complicated code they used. A later deployment on the Blackwell Railway did as well, but as some of the wires broke, operators improvised with a two-wire system, developing a more parsimonious code. Realizing fewer wires were needed, future deployments were simplified. In 1844, after 10 years of lobbying, using a federal appropriation of $30,000, a not inconsiderable sum, Samuel Morse built a line between Baltimore and Washington along the right-of-way of a skeptical Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that it concerns that a telegraph might substitute and eliminate much passenger travel. A demonstration transmitting the passenger list on a train ahead of the passengers gave proof of the utility of the telegraph. Morse so also took in a financing partner, Alfred Vail. Other applications of the Baltimore-Washington line, including apprehending criminals and verifying checks. By 1845, the Magnetic Telegraph Company was formed to exploit the invention, building lines between major East Coast cities, the first opened in 1846. The first year, the line was still running a loss, despite charging one cent for four characters. The federal government allowed Vail and his partners to acquire the federally funded Baltimore-Washington line in 1847, but soon telegraphy turned profitable and development exploded. By the 1850s, consideration was given to laying a transatlantic cable, despite huge technical obstacles. By 1858, the Atlantic Telegraph Company had laid the first transatlantic cable and messages were transmitted. However, the cable soon broke. This thread across the ocean, as goes the title of one book on the subject, was the premier engineering accomplishment of its day, employing the labors of Isambard Kingdom Brunel and the future Lord Kelvin, a work that failed four times before achieving success. The effort was led by Cyrus Field, an American entrepreneur and visionary who, despite failing, kept raising funds and kept hope alive that the transatlantic telegraph cable was not a fool's errand, but a wise investment that would return profits to investors. Each failure, resulting from cable snapping or going dead, led to design improvements, stronger, more ductile cables that would be more robust in the difficult design conditions of the cold Atlantic seafloor. But stronger, heavier cables could not be handled by the conventional ships of the age. It required the world's largest ship, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's The Great Eastern, which was used on the fourth and ultimately successful fifth voyages laying cables. Constructing the greatest communications network at the time, an endeavor that would substitute for traditional transportation-reliant material communication, mail, required the greatest transportation vehicle at the time to lay. 
The learning involved was not simply building stronger cable, but how to lay cable so it wouldn't break, how to fetch dead and broken cable from the ocean floor, how to send electric signals thousands of kilometers without fading despite the cable being submerged inside an electrical conductor, seawater, and how to manage a transatlantic enterprise. Soon after the ultimate success in 1866, the fourth failed cable was resurrected and reconnected, giving a second redundant link. Its owners enjoyed a brief monopoly, but soon brought prices down to increase demand and shortly thereafter faced competition. The competing cables were also laid by the Great Eastern. By 1903, there were more than 15 distinct transatlantic cables, which meant that communications would not be severed even during two world wars. By 1861, a North American transcontinental line was opened by Western Union, forcing the Pony Express out of business. While the Pony Express was fast, 10 days to travel 2,900 kilometers, the telegraph was almost instantaneous. Western Union, which eventually acquired a monopoly in telegraph services, was founded in 1851 in Rochester, New York, as the New York and Mississippi Valley Printing Telegraph Company, and took its current name in 1856 before opening up the transcontinental line. By 1866, the Western Union had acquired another 340 telegraph companies. It established relationships with most United States railroads and carried some 80% of telegraph messages by the 1880s. The telegraph proved very important to the operation of long-distance train services. Imagine you have one rail line between two points, but you want to operate trains in two directions. In the absence of instantaneous communications, you can set up a very precise schedule, but trains sometimes get delayed or you can set up a very coarse schedule, eastbound in the morning, westbound in the afternoon, but then trains will needlessly sit idle for hours. Or you could have a rule whereby inferior trains would wait until superior trains passed. With the telegraph, you can set up a dispatch and signaling system and know when trains are coming from one direction to put a red light in the other, delaying trains for the minimal amount of time. This system also reduces the amount of track you need to build, lowering costs, wire is much less expensive than track. Train dispatching by telegraph took place in Great Britain in 1839 and was deployed along the New York and Erie Railroad in 1849. By the 1850s, telegraphic control of trains was commonplace. Typical clerks and station masters at train stations were telegraph operators, suggesting another synergy to more effectively use available labor. The telegraph was also responsible for establishing standard railway time, which became standard time shaping everyone's life. The railways adopted time zones so the train leaving New York at 11 a.m. was also recorded as leaving at 11 a.m. by observers in Philadelphia or Washington, D.C., both of which are west of New York City and had been offset by a few minutes. The Western Union time ball would drop daily from their headquarters, the tallest building in the United States at the time, at noon in New York, triggered by an operator at the National Observatory in Washington, D.C. from 1883 to 1913. Western Union came under the control of financier and railroad magnate Jay Gould. In the two decades after the telegraph was developed, it had become the most important communication technology since the printing press, obviating distance as a barrier to exchange of information, so long as wires connected the two ends. Where previously it may have taken days or weeks for messages to be received, with the telegraph it was reduced to seconds. Yet not all ends were connected with wires, and though information could travel instantaneously within Europe or within North America, it could not travel the same distance between the continents but aboard a ship. Bringing the old world and new world together required laying a telegraph cable across the Atlantic Ocean. The table would complete the missing link in the global communication system, melding the separate networks into one. But not only would the communications networks now operate faster, the implications for commerce would be enormous. The world could operate as a single financial market. A live wire between Europe and its overseas colonies meant that military crises could be diffused or managed or exacerbated without the delay imposed by requiring communications to ride upon the fastest means of transport. The telegraph improved logistics. The railroads used it to coordinate the movement of people. One could, for instance, buy a ticket on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad with connections to the Milwaukee Road and Great Northern, a multi-firm transaction enabled by electronic information. Firms such as Ford used the telegraph to monitor and control inputs and outputs. Telegraphy peaked between 1830, when there were about 16,000 U.S. telegraph messengers total, in 1945, when the number of telegrams sent in the U.S. peaked, Western Union sent 200 million telegrams globally at its peak in 1929. The number has declined since then, being insignificant after 1950. The term battle of the networks applied to the competition of alternating and direct electrical current. It could just as easily apply to the many transatlantic telegraph cables, the railroad wars, 
in events such as Gould's largely legal threat to break the Union Pacific's spatial monopoly on traffic in the middle part of the country to extort a payoff. Consolidating monopolies is important to control costs and ensure profits in network industries. And the railroads, with over 150 years of consolidation behind them, have done that. American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, did that for 70 years. It tried to do that again in the cable television industry. Other firms are fighting a losing battle and trying to gain monopoly status. Airlines are attempting to establish alliances with other airlines to provide better services and further entrench customers within their system through frequent flyer systems, thereby making them slightly less price sensitive. It appears that the structure, performance, and conduct of transport systems are replicated in other systems. Transport shares characteristics with other systems that are highly networked and standardized, serve as universal input industries and are everywhere available, have strong economies of scale, affect the public interest so much that they have been publicly supplied or closely controlled. While water supply and electricity come to mind, there are also systems where the predominant technology is soft, for example, the public school system. In addition to structural similarities, we see functional similarities between transport and communications. Each is an organizing system. They organize the structure of production and consumption. The what does it do that is worth doing question is similar for each, and answers tend to be rather hidden.